There's some more chairs. Good morning again. Uh, my name is Fiona Lau. I'm a program manager at Civic Exchange. Welcome to today's report launch. I'm, I'm your MC and facilitator for the panel discussion today. Um, and as you know, our, our report uh, name is Private Development and Management of Public Open Space of the Victoria Harbour Waterfront. So welcome again. As some of you might be aware, uh, the recent sale of the central site for each of Henderson Land, uh, it's a massive commercial development which will include at least 25,000 square meters of public open space. So this also indicates that the private sector will play a major role in managing um, this and other water front uh, development and public space in the years coming. In this year's policy address, Carrie Lam committed to improving connectivity and increasing public space through collaborative management, which we will discuss more in de detail later. Which um, and we can see um, like a big recent upgrade in our uh, waterfront, uh, whether it's on the TSD front and also Hong Kong Island. The report we are launching today takes a necessary look at the processes of planning, implementing, monitoring, and maintaining the quality of these spaces to ensure that they serve the public interest. It continues the exchange. Uh, long-standing interest and also Karine's long-standing research interest in the quality of public realm in support of a livable and sustainable Hong Kong. Uh, Civic Exchange, I would like to thank Wayne Foundation for this amazing space, uh, for this launch, and for the financial support of this uh, report. Um, and congratulations again, Karine, for the report uh, completion. Uh, today's rundown is quite simple. Um, we, were, we will first hear a presentation from Karine, uh, around 20 minutes, um, and then we will quickly move into a panel discussion with uh, four, uh, including Karine, four distinguished good guests. Um, and then we will uh, get some questions from all of you later on. Um, if there's no any other question, let us welcome Karine for the presentation. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. So I'm just going to launch straight into it. Um, today I want to talk about the governance mechanisms for managing privately managed open spaces on the Victoria Harbour waterfront. Um, because there are some uh, gaps in the current mechanisms and ways that they can be improved. So I'm going to address uh, some of these today. You might want to take off my mask and keep slipping around. <laughs> so just as some background, um, there are 73 kilometers of coastline around the Victoria Harbor area within the jurisdiction of the Harbor Front um, Commission. So about 25 of them are currently accessible to the public. 13 are planned for public access or under construction. Um, there's probably about seven more that could potentially be made publicly accessible, but the rest of 28 is going to be long-term inaccessible. And I am going to show you why. So this is what we have currently. Oh, uh, no, oops, wrong, 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 wrong. Okay, here. So the blue and orange solid lines that you can see are the ones areas that are currently publicly accessible. The dotted lines are those which are planned. Blue means it's managed by the government, and orange are those that are privately managed or will be privately managed in the future. The long-term inaccessible stuff is basically the, the cargo terminals and all of this heavy infrastructure around here, as well as this um, public cargo working area here, which could be made accessible in theory, but it will take quite a lot of doing. Yeah, there's a footpath that's not very well connected right now, but... <laughs> I, I walked halfway down and got stuck. <laughs> um, so, the reason we want to focus on the privately managed spaces now and in the future is that the government essentially plans for the private sector to play a major role in managing a waterfront public open spaces. Um, and it gives two reasons for this. One is that 
the private sector and the nonprofit sector are more flexible than the government and therefore seen as able to deliver more unique and creative attractions and amenities than your standard issue LCSD facilities. The second one is that the government wants private financing to be involved in the waterfront. They don't want to fund the entire thing. They want a private investment. They want uh, corporate sponsorships. They want private donations from the nonprofit sector to help in sort of creating these public attractions and, and amenities. So there are two major types of um, privately managed public owned spaces under two different governance mechanisms that I'm going to address today. It's, some of you will know a lot about this already, some of this might be new to some of you, but the first one is the public open spaces in private developments called POSPD. And this is when a commercial developer builds a development and the planning department basically requires them to create and manage a public open space as a condition of getting planning approval for that development. Um, so, um, we have, this is not just in the waterfront, there's like many of them all over Hong Kong, and there was, for many years, like quite a lot of controversies over the way that they were managed and maintained. Not necessarily always kept publicly accessible, not necessarily always maintained water very well, and as a result of these complaints in 2009, the government actually stopped using this mechanism for the majority of, of new um, developments. But major exception is the waterfront. There are still several major waterfront developments that will be using this mechanism to, use, to make the promenade in the future. Um, the second mechanism is public-private partnerships, and these are not really attached to a, um, you know, a property development. They're sort of standalone projects, and they're created through a contract between a government department and a private sector entity. Um, that means they're more flexible, um, and, and the government is you know, considering both for-profit and non-profit ones. However, there's not too many of them in Hong Kong yet, so the precedents are not yet well established. So first I'm going to talk about the POSPD and the way that they're currently governed right now. Um, so the mechanisms for managing, like governing these and maintaining accountability are actually quite limited. So what happens is that when the planning department says, developer, you must put this public open space in your development, it is then written into the land base when they sell the land to the developer. It's like, contractually, you must take care of the space. But it's very inflexible, like a land lease lasts for the entire duration of like the existence of that property, essentially, and it's very difficult to you know, alter it. So when you're talking about managing a public space whose needs might change over time, there's really no way to you know, do anything to, to change that. Um, so for operational standards and more detailed day-to-day -day stuff, you really can't do that. It's basic, like the requirements are very basic. It's like you must have it open from X to Y hours per day. It must be accessible to the public. It must be maintained. But there's very, very little that is described beyond that in most of these agreements. And the second is that there's no real way of enforcing them. Like if the government finds that a developer has been breaching the terms of the lease, what it can do is sort of like log so they call an encumbrance in the land registry against the property, but that doesn't actually have any effect until the property is sold to someone else, I think. I'm not a lawyer, but yes. The second option is for the government to just take the land back, but that's basically never going to happen unless it is so dangerous that people risk getting killed on that space. Um, the second issue is that like, after these complaints back in 2009, the government actually developed some guidelines for future um, POSPDs, but these are actually very broad scale, broad spectrum guidelines that are not very well tailored to public open spaces in waterfronts specifically. So I'll talk a little more about these 2011 guidelines. And the first thing we're going to look at is the way they define a promenade, which is basically the most simple and basic definition of a promenade that you can possibly come up with, which is a linear public open space joined on either end to a road. That's it. And in terms of managing the activities that take place on the space, 
the always permissible activities are very limited if you read this. It is leisure activities such as passive activities, walking, and temporary stay. So walking and sitting. Um, the other guide, like the guidelines also define non-commercial ch or slash charitable activities and commercial activities. And these require like basically higher levels of getting permissions from government departments to do. Um, so you need waivers, licenses, and in terms of commercial activities, you have to pay the difference in the value of the land without the commercial activity and the value of the land with the commercial activity to the lands department. So it can be quite expensive to do any commercial activities on there. And it's limited to 10% of the space, which, I mean, it makes sense. They don't want these public open spaces to be taken over by private commercial activities necessarily, but that might not be suitable for the waterfront where you actually want more vibrancy. So this is quite restrictive. Um, so let's move on to this. So the current mechanisms leave some unanswered questions. I'll give you a couple examples. For example, the um, government plans to build a greenway, like a shared pedestrian cycle path along all of Kai Tak. And it's probably extending you know, further. But there are going to be two areas that pass through private developments that will be maintained by the developer, like commercial like shopping malls here. So the developers are required to build the cycle path in the lease when they sold the land to the developer. However, there's nothing in the contract that says that it must be maintained as a cycle path. So I don't know what's going to happen, but theoretically it would be completely legal for them to put bollards at both ends and say no cycling. That would be completely legal within their discretion. So we just have to trust them. Second unanswered question. Okay, so it was in the news recently that Henderson Land has bought Site 3 in Central, which is the big empty piece of land in front of the Star Ferry going down to the uh, post office that will be redeveloped. Um, and in the tender requirements, um, the developers were required to submit a plan to manage the public open space, of which there is a lot, as a free, inclusive, and vibrant public space with active management and innovative programming. So here the developer is being asked not just to provide passive public space, you know, just benches to people to sit on, but to have like, active um, events, activities, and to do it in an inclusive way. So when the, they bid it, they had to submit this plan, but afterwards, how do you make sure that they actually deliver it? The lease mechanism cannot do this. The lease mechanism can say you must keep it open, like physically accessible for certain hours of the day, but they can't say you must have events. Like there's no way to govern that right now. So, I have some recommendations for improving the way that POSPDs are going to be managed on the waterfront. First, there should be separate operational contracts to manage these spaces. So in addition to the lease condition, the lease condition say, you must follow this contract. And separately, you have a contract with the detailed requirements of how it's going to be managed and programmed. Um, a second side issue is that um, as a result of the previous complaints, um, now the government usually retains ownership of the strip of promenade, but says the developer must maintain it and manage it until the government asks for it to be given back. So that's basically the government giving itself some extra security due to these previous problems. But one problem that arises from that is that there's no timeline for when the government wants it back, which means that no one can really plan them to be very creative or innovative because you expect that if you might have to hand it back to the LCSD tomorrow, why would you invest in it? And secondly, sometimes the government doesn't even want innovative stuff on there because if the LCSD has to take it back tomorrow, then they get saddled with this thing that they have no idea how to match. And they're like, no, just keep it simple. Put some benches there, it's fine. Um, 
So another thing the government's currently doing is um, trying to put um, district-wide design standards at KITAC. Like there's a whole design manual guideline for the whole KITAC area to make sure that everything sort of stays consistent in design, whether it's privately or publicly developed. But like this basically sets a floor. It's like you cannot be worse than this, but then it doesn't really encourage innovation either because a lot of these standards are very, very specific and prescriptive. So um, one of the suggestions is instead of just selling the land to the highest builder, if there's like a key like prime waterfront site where you really want to have something special, then you should use this different mechanism, for example, design competitions to choose who's going to develop it. So I'm going to move on to public-private partnerships right now. Um, so currently, the government's public-private partnership guidelines were created by the efficiency um, unit about 12 years ago, 13 years ago. But these are really intended for large infrastructure projects, bridges, tunnels, waste management facilities, and big stuff, under a design-build-operate model. But it doesn't really apply that well to the waterfront, where you tend to get more short-term projects, nonprofit projects. And there's like problems with applying it to public spaces as well, since public spaces need to be relatively free and inclusive as a principle. Um, but there are two relevant principles that you can draw out of these guidelines, and one is performance-based pay for a PPP the operator should be paid for good performance over time. It shouldn't be just, okay, you just contracted a lump sum at the beginning, you build it. Um, and the second is, PPP should be used if the government can get good value for its money. Like if the private sector is able to deliver something over and above what the government would be able to do itself, then that is when it's worth doing PPP. So here's like, there's just a handful of spaces that roughly fall under the definition of PPP at the moment, and they're not really fitting the traditional definition in most cases. So the closest to the traditional definition is this, the Cutex Sports Park, which is still under construction, which consists of several large stadiums and sports facilities. And it's both for-profit and long-term, which is closer to the definition of your traditional PPP, but uh, deviate significantly in certain ways because the government is basically funding the whole construction of this. Um, the second here, the Avenue of the Stars, relatively similar in that it's long term, but it's like managed as a like non-profit space um, by the developer, which doesn't mind doing this because it enhances the property values next door. So the actual waterfront space is non-profit but it basically benefits the shopping mall behind it. Oh. Third, okay, getting further away from your traditional definition, the observation wheel, which is a short-term three-year contract, which is very, very different than a standard PVP, and is also for profit. And the fourth, completely different short-term and non-profit, the vessel, sort of event space and um, urban farm under the flyover in Kuntong. So when you're doing a PPP in a public space, it actually is a little bit tricky to balance all of these goals. First, you need to have an accountability mechanism to ensure that the operator is delivering to a high standard. Second, it needs to be financed. Where's the money coming from? Is it for profit? Is it going to be relying on donations? Is it going to be government funded? How do you make the numbers work? And third, it needs to be inclusive. Like, it's not like a toll bridge or a tunnel, like you pay a fee to go in. You can't do that with a public space. You're not making a theme park, right? So how do you make sure that you can pay the bills and also keep it inclusive and also deliver to a high standard? Like, that's a tricky balancing act, and I don't think our current mechanisms have really figured that out yet. Like, our current guidelines haven't really figured that out yet. So I'm going to talk about the examples that I just brought up. So as I mentioned, the government's funding the entire thing. Um, so um, a standard way for PPPs to incentivize good performances with profit sharing arrangements between the government and the operator, but here the government's just receiving 3% of the income, so that's not really gonna work that well. 
So as a result, they have imposed the contract says that there will be quite steep financial penalties if they do not meet their targets. Like if you can't hold a certain number of events in these stadiums, if you can't fill the stadiums to a certain level, and also if they um, stop the public from using these facilities for more than two thirds of the year, they have to pay fines. But then that brings like the whole financial viability of the entire large scale project into question. So we're not really sure how it's going to work when it's built. And also COVID. Um, with the Avenue of the Stars, the main issue here was actually with accountability. Um, the original agreement signed between LCSD and um, the developer, like New World Development, in 2003, um, they didn't have a clear accountability mechanism. It was like the very first one the government did, um, and there was no clear performance metrics, no performance evaluation schedule, there's like no consequences if the, the, the the operator doesn't deliver a good standard. Um, they did have a joint management committee where, like, made up of the developer side and, and various government representatives to discuss you know, day to day management issues, but that was pretty much you know, just a forum to talk about stuff, but not necessarily really to address any problems that came up. And so when it was, um, they planned to revamp the entire space in 2015 to 16. This actually caused the whole public controversy over at Radio of the Stars because um, a lot of um, the public interest groups um, thought that the plans would be too commercial. It basically put too many commercial facilities on the waterfront that was just designed to benefit the developer and not the public. And as a result of these public objections, um, the plans were scaled down and simplified, which gives you what we have today, which is you know, considerably better than the, the 2003 version. Um, the 2003 version actually got named by CNN as one of the worst tourist traps in the world. So this is much better, but it, it, you know, it took a long time. The problem with the observation wheel was, again, with the financing because it was privately financed entirely and it's for profit, but on a three-year contract, that's not really enough time for them to get their investment back. I mean, the three-year contract is useful for the government because if one operator does a bad job, you just contract it out to someone else in the future. But when this happened in 2016, um, the old operator didn't want to sell the new operator the wheel at a price that the new operator was willing to pay. And as a result, the whole attraction was shut down for about three or four months. And if they did not come to an agreement in the end, they would have had to tear it down and rebuild it, which would have taken like over a year. So matching the length of the contract to like the level of investment that is needed didn't really happen in this case. And if you're going to have such short contracts, then basically you can really only do low budget stuff. So with the issues with the vessel, again, this, this one was a totally nonprofit project. Um, the government did provide some subsidy in the form of sort of like upfront construction costs, and the land is like basically free as like one dollar a year in rent or something um, to this nonprofit organization. Um, but that means that if you're not doing pay for performance, that means the government's just giving a lump sum up front and it's like, okay, you find the money to run it afterwards. And as for how we incentivize good performance afterwards, so in some ways it is like pretty good in that it's inclusively managed. I mean, it's flexible. You can all have dogs in there, like kids use it for skateboarding. Um, but the problem is that because it needs to be entirely self-funding, um, a lot of local artists complain that they can't afford the event spaces. It's, I think, 20% less than commercial rates, which, I mean, there's some discount there, but I mean, if you're a broke local artist working out of an industrial building in Phu Tong, it's still unaffordable. So in terms of, um, Doing PPPs in the future, uh, I think the government mindset needs to shift a little bit. So, in terms of these two principles, pay for performance and value for money. So, for the cases where the government has subsidized these projects so far, it's usually sort of upfront construction costs instead of long-term operational costs, which means you're not linking the pay to performance. That means it's not meeting what a PPP is supposed to be. 
And so if you don't have this link, then how do you incentivize good performance? How do you maintain the standards? These things need to be linked back up. Um, government currently sees um, private investment or fundraising as a way of reducing its own expenditures, but this is somewhat, you know, short-sighted in that if you're looking at the concept of value for money, it's worth paying for it if you get the result that is better than what the government can deliver on its own. If you really get a unique facility, if somebody's able to provide something that the government can't, then it's still worth paying for because you're getting value for money. If you just say, okay, it's not free, so we're not doing it, then that's kind of a short-sighted way of thinking about it. So in terms of um, recommending, say, recommendations for PBTs and PBTs, um, when they build, when they um, create contracts for these, they do need regular performance review process with agreed upon rewards, penalties, and remedies, which is the mistake they made with at the stars. I mean, they've learned from that. They're, they're, they're starting to add these things to the viewer ones that they're putting in. Um, but yeah, that was a rather painful lesson. Um, if you have for-profit projects, the agreement should be structured to incentivize um, the operator to fulfill inclusive social objectives. Like if you have more inclusive events, if you make it more easy for people to use accessible welcoming, then you should get some kind of financial reward for that. Because right now, if you're running it for profit, if you're going to do a lot of free stuff, you're not making money off of that, so why would you do it? Unless you're just required, and you do the bare minimum to meet the requirement. Um, if you have short-term tendencies, you need to match that to the length of the level of investment you expect in the site. If it's beyond, I think, what was it, seven years, then you need to move to a different form of contract, which can go up to 21 years. I forgot the name of that, but there are experts in the audience. Um, and for these nonprofit projects that don't have a lot of commercial potential, I think the government needs to be willing to subsidize them in the long term. So these are my four major recommendations for the PPPs. Um, thank you for coming. <laughs>